are you this morning? Oh, I'm great. I'm good. It's always busy here. You look, uh, you look amazing. You look uh, so glowing. Thank you. <laughs> you look great too. Thank you. It's been a while. I haven't seen you in, gosh, two years? Almost. Yeah. Not, yeah. It's been almost two years since I, I came to Egypt and discovered Egypt through you and it actually it did really change my life. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very intense. And um, yes, and I, I went back to Israel and, uh, you know, proceeded with my, with my research and it's just getting more and more intense. Yeah, I could see where you were going and I've been watching your posts and it's really exciting to see all the work that you're doing. I'm so happy to see it happening everywhere, you know, and you have all the tools. So, you know, wow, fantastic. It's, you know, it's wonderful, you know, I'm feeling so grateful for, to have, you know, to know you and to have really amazing colleagues. You know, I learn from you so much all the time. Yeah, I feel the same way, Yasmin. It's funny because all of the people I know, it's, it's not one person knows everything. It's never that way. Everybody brings their, their level of expertise to the table. And I just love when you can put, start weaving all the pieces together you know just by being open-minded and sharing with all the different people and like you said all your colleagues so yeah it's it's been a great it's been a great couple of years for that yeah and i think uh that you know the energy of collaboration instead of competition is getting much more much more you know intense and uh, people you know are more coming together and it's, it's especially important, I think, in this field of Egyptology because, uh, you know, we are talking about a field of research that has a deep chasm in it, like two major schools, the, the mainstream and, uh, uh, Egyptology versus chemitology, symbolistic uh, Egyptology. And I, I, wa I was meaning to ask you, you know, about this uh, how how do you feel about this and how is this evolving nowadays but i guess my first question for you is uh, maybe first of all make a, an introductory and tell us about yourself a bit about your history your childhood and what led you to to your research today well that's 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 a story that could be told in days but i'll try and be brief <laughs> Um, I am Patricia Aoyan Lehman. I actually, in Egypt, when you marry an Egyptian, you do not take on their name. However, on Facebook, you know, everybody, you know, tends to, we, we present ourselves to the world. All of the, in fact, all of the Aoyans are the same. They take on the Aoyan name. It's sort of like a tribal name, but most of them, you don't, you don't carry on a last name like we do. So that's, I find that fascinating too. It's quite different here than it is in, in, West, in the Western world where you, you carry on a last name through generations through the masculine in most cases. Um, but in any event, um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, way out in the boondocks. My dad uh, bought a property in the country and I had lakes and trees and you know we planted gardens, we planted trees. It was an amazing upbringing. But when I first looked at my dad's uh, National Geographic magazines and saw the pictures of Egypt, as well as his coffee type, you know, the coffee table books, I immediately knew something drew me to all of those pictures. And I knew that that, I have to say the word home, it felt like home to me. And I was, you know, just totally focused and uh, absorbed by anything Egypt from a very, very young age, probably six or seven. Um, I'd wait for every National Geographic to come in just to, to page through it to see if there was anything on Egypt in it. So my attachment started quite young. Um, I did not come to Egypt until my 40s, however, um, and that's because I was waiting until, you know, I kind of follow my inner guidance and it's, it just never lets me down. It's when my head gets in the way that I get into trouble. But in, in any event, I've studied esoteric sciences my whole life. And uh, I, I, I was also born with this need to know. I, um, uh, I had a lot of interesting experiences when I was young. Um, even in my, my early teens, I started astral projecting. 
which was quite, uh, you know, it's a phenomenon when you first experience it, it can be horrifying until you understand what it is. Um, but I, I, I played with it, did it at will for many, many years. And I have discovered now that I'm teaching and doing this work that I find that the people that really connect with my work have either had astral experiences or um, near death experiences or have done plant medicine. And I believe that's because I speak a lot about moving between form and formless realities, perceptions, um, levels of consciousness, dimensions even. And people that have had these experiences can really connect with that. So I really feel that that was an integral part of my early education is having all of these experiences and learning about that other, you know, formless reality that I think exists in parallel with ours on many different levels. Um, but in any event, I did move to Egypt. Oh boy. My first trip was in 2005. I came to meet Abdel Hakim Aouyan. Um, I had read about him when I was trying to search for the first, you know, I knew I was coming to Egypt. I was told it was time to come. And uh, I needed, it needed to be a really profound experience for me. So I did a lot of research and I found a tour that was hosted by Stephen Mailer, whom I think you know. Yes. And uh, he talked about this Abdel Hakim and I went out and bought both books by Stephen Mailer, uh, From Light Into Darkness and Land of Osiris. And I, it, everything that was in the books that he spoke about, and these are, are two books that he had written with Hakim, uh, totally resonated with all of my learning and, and all of my feelings about Egypt. So I knew that this was the time to come. That tour was amazing. Stephen's passion was amazing. It ignited something in me. I knew at that point I'd be coming back to Egypt. Um, but it wasn't, uh, it, and actually Stephen asked me, you know, if you were gonna come back on a tour of Egypt, what would you do? You know, how would you make it different? And I said, well, I'd spend more time at the sites and um, I would see if we could get Hakim to come out of retirement. And Stephen took me up on my suggestion and asked him and he did come out of retirement. A year and a half later, I find myself back in Egypt traveling with this amazing man who um, is known here for those who don't know who he is, he, anyone who's seen the Pyramid Code, of course, uh, will remember the, the older gentleman that Carmen Bolter interviews throughout the, um, <clears throat> the series. He's just an amazing, was an amazing, profound um, man that seemed to know, he, he garnered his knowledge, and I know I'm running on here, but there's, it, there's just so much to tell. He got most of his knowledge, I mean, he garnered his knowledge from many different sources. He did have degrees in archeology span and Egyptology. He told me once, and I've said this before, that he had to, the hardest thing he ever had to do was unlearn what he had learned um, at university in order to experience and, and grasp what it was he was seeing in plain sight that was not addressed by these academic uh, modalities. And so, you know, and I began to understand, he said, it's looking at things in a new way, opening your eyes, opening senses, and talked about senses, and this really made sense to me. So anyway, this tour was phenomenal. I got to see Egypt through his eyes, see people. He hadn't been to some of the sites in years and years, and when we would get to the site, some of them, the people, the locals, and the local keepers of the sites would come out of the woodwork, and there'd be tears in their eyes. They were so excited to see him hugs and tears and they pull out the shisha and they make coffee and it was like and, and Hakim was just you know so taken with all the sights it was just beautiful to experience it this way and also to get to get his words of wisdom in each and every site um, and of course it was not long after this that I uh, met I hadn't even met Yosef um, uh, Hakim's son until I think my third trip to Egypt and it, you know, and it was then, and it, we actually got married the year that Hakim had passed, which was sad. But I, I was fortunate to have the experiences with him that I did. And um, I did make me Egypt my home. I've been here now, it's almost 12 years. We're going on 12 years. Wow. So it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, I lived at the foot of the pyramids for eight years in front of the Sphinx, had coffee with the Sphinx in the morning. Um, and I've just spent these last years uh, here in Egypt just totally immersed in research on everything, uh, the symbolism, uh, the mythology, and what it actually means. 
I've traveled all over the world these past uh, many years. I've done some tours, but I used to even travel on my own. And I'm able to see and experience the cross-cultural referencing that is exactly the same. It's a mirror all over the world. They're all telling the same story. And it's incredibly exciting and profound. And I don't, I don't know that, you know, it's so hard to get, to actually express it to an audience that doesn't understand that is so immersed in what's three dimensional in order to have people realize that we don't always exist in this perception of reality. So I guess that's really where I'm at now is finding the words, finding the tools, finding the ways to prevent, present the information in such a way that people can grasp that there are changes ahead and life will not always be like it is now and it, it wasn't like it is now that consciousness rises and falls and uh, we're at one of those pivotal moments when everything's about to change wow yes i love that you had uh, this opportunity from a young age to be connected with spirituality in such a profound level that you that you did and that would probably was probably some of the soul initiation that you came here to do and this probably prepared you so many years before you came to Egypt to understand Egypt and the history in such a context so what what would you say is the the process that you are going through that is evolving you as a teacher because you just said that you are finding yourself in a in a times where you're finding new words and new ways of expressing your knowledge so what would you say about that well what i'm finding it, it's funny a lot of my information and this has been all my life comes to me in dream form or through uh intuition or even you know, I'm finding more and more today, it, it's funny as we're moving into this digital arena, there's so many things happening to us. Some people are aware and some aren't that, you know, we, we have a thought and it suddenly shows up on the internet. And this isn't, you know, it, it's a very strange, but there's this, there's an interaction happening um, between us and the other world, whether it's um, uh, manipulation from behind the scenes or whether it's actually just happening because everything's becoming more connected. Uh, we're moving, in my opinion, out of a separation consciousness into a unified consciousness. This is the next step. And, uh, you know, I, I also talk about, you know, this is, we're moving into the time of the age of Aquarius. And what that means, if you even look at the symbol, he's emptying the containers. And this is the container, you know, we're in a, a separation consciousness is, is uh, defined by us believing that we are our bodies. We believe we're separate from everything outside ourselves. And I call this falling into form. We fell, it's like the fallen angels, angles of light into a perception that, oh wow, I'm locked in a container that is my form. And once we empty that container, we begin to feel, again, the energy around us. We begin to feel the current. We're made up of current, waveform, light. We're, we're light beings. And we're beginning, I believe, to feel that again, whether we have the words to describe it or not. But I think what I'm finding is things are appearing to me that I've seen all the time. Every time I go to the temples, Dendera being my favorite, the temple of Hattori Dendera is just an, an amazing, amazing structure in Egypt. The entire temple, this, as I, I was saying, was my, it's my favorite place to teach. It's my favorite place to learn. Um, one of the identifying factors you move into this temple and as you're entering it you're entering the first gate and you look up and hakim would say this you look up and it's the only place in egypt that you see the underbelly of the winged pepper the the winged scarab and the winged scarab is the symbol of the new awakening into a day or unified cycle unified consciousness and so he said this meant that you're entering a structure that contains the answers to all the secrets of the universe. So of course, this was enough for me to say, wow, I really want to, I really want to figure this out. And, you, and the structure itself, you walk in and you know, the amazing symbols and, and iconography all over the walls, the ceiling, oh my gosh. And the structure itself is embodying the nature of reality. 
So, you know, and, and just for a quick example, you walk in and you look up and you see in two dimensions, the cycles of the day and the year and the great year all spiraling around you and the ceiling above you. And then when you go up to the second floor, you actually go up on the day side, if you're talking about the great year, you, you spiral, the, the, the staircase spirals up to the next level. You spring from winter into summer, yes? And then when you go to the other side and you come down, you fall back into the night cycle, spring, summer, fall, winter. So the temple is structured to teach us about the cycles of life. In India, this is Vishnu. He represents you know, the, the, the birth, the, the sustainability, the living, the death, and the rebirth. There's, there's all of these cycles within one full circle expression. And within that expression, there's a reversal. And this is written in several different ways. So you ask me, how, how is it changing? I've been going to this temple for, for the last 12 years, or, well, yeah, because I came before uh, I, I came to live here. And every time I go, I, I learn something new. You know, I, 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 there's so much, you can't possibly take it all in one visit or 10 or 20 or even 100 visits. But the more I study it, the more that things pop off the walls. Each time I go, there's something that pops off and then I'll open a book and it answers my questions about what it means. And so the story is being knitted together so perfectly. And it's, it's literally, it amazes me how they were able to express all of the details in a way that's showing you the different levels of not only understanding, but the different dimensions of how the cycles and cycles within cycles work, not only with the structure, but with the symbolism on the walls. So when they speak about the hours of a day, they're also speaking about the months of the year, and they're also speaking about the reversal of the great year as precesses. So it's, in, and, and they weave it all together in this beautiful symbolism that speaks of death, you know, the separation of, of Osiris getting chopped into the, the 42 pieces, 14 if you're talking about the moon, 42 pieces if you're talking about the land, uh, the, the gnomes of Egypt. This is separation consciousness. We separate into different tribes. We believe we're, we're totally different. You have a different color skin than me. And suddenly we can't feel each other and so we need words and written language, oral and written language in order to communicate. But that's when we fell into that separation. The time before that, when we built pyramids and we built megalithic structures worldwide, we had the tools because we, we felt the currents. We knew how to harness the natural forces of nature, which are the netters, um, in order to create. And, and, and I, I, I almost, the way I feel it happens is we create the game board that we know we're gonna be playing on as we lose our senses, our ability to sense, you know, the, the, as Hakim said, we at one time had 360 senses, if you can imagine. I, I, I call that full circle sensibility or awareness. Mm -hmm. And they start to shut down as we separate, as we fall into separation, those senses tend to shut down and we lose our ability to feel. And so now we're in a world where we think, you know, we're all different and we're dense and we feel everything is heavy. And yet it's just a perception. It's not reality. It's the reality is, is the illusion. As so, so many different cultures tell us. Amazing. It's so fascinating and it's so layered. And it, it, I'm just, you know, so uh, in so much uh, uh, admiration, you know, for your dedication. And I think we should, do, we should totally uh, do maybe a talk just about Dendera if you oh, want in the future because I love Dendera as well uh, so much and I would love to learn more about how the knowledge is being put uh, on the walls and the ceilings and what is the inner logic of the placement of everything and when I was there with you and the group I took a lot of videos and when I went back to Israel and I was looking at them frame by frame and suddenly it dawned on me that the, the, the details on the ceilings are so tiny and also carved, painted and probably 
with a golden gold gold leaf flare on them, right? Uh, in, in some areas, probably most probably um, there was much gold in Egypt, and most of it was was taken long ago. <laughs> Anything valuable is stripped. I mean, often when you see hollow eyes, you're you know, a hole where the uraeus might have been, uh, it probably was precious metal or, or a gem. Yes, so as an artist, I suddenly realized how amazing in quality the work of the craftsmen was to do uh, all the, the hieroglyphs in such tiny size, you know, like an inch, uh, a hieroglyph that is a, an inch or even less uh, big. And I was also wondering why they, they do it so small, because you can't really enjoy the whole magnitude of it when you look at it from, you know, 50 meters uh, from the ground or whatever. So do you have any, any thoughts of that? I believed they, when they created, they used everything, all the space that was available to them. And the story they were telling is quite intricate. And I, I, you know, I even, I think I even pointed out to the group at the time, they even used the space in between the forms. Um, so in, in, there are certain areas where you can really see this, like in between Newt's hands, you see that there is the sycamore tree, the sycamore being the sacred feminine tree. Um, and she is, of course, the womb or that is the Wilkie, Milky Way that gives birth, you know, from the primordial waters of, of the stars, it gives birth to form. Um, and I think within that story, she there's all the intricacies of how form is created and then how it cycles. And you know, then you see all of these netters, they're they're you're you're looking at the constellations. When they when they say as above, so below, they're actually saying almost that what we see when we're looking at the, the stars and the and the planets and all of the, see, life itself is movement. So time and space, as all the indigenous worldwide say, are illusions, right? But they're illusion based on our perception of movement. So we see this waveform moving, and what we're, we're, we're measuring our time on is the stars, the moon, and the sun, right? Our day, our lunar calendars, and we often have uh, stellar calendars like Sirius, which they did in Egypt. Um, and they're looking at the movements to determine what reality is. So in a way, the stars are just a map to show us what's happening here on earth. So when you're looking at all those little details, it seems so far above, you know, the artists, they probably, you know, I don't know that they painted them from the ceiling. They probably painted, painted the blocks and, and put them up there. Some of those things could have been restored from an earlier temple. I've heard all kinds of theories about that. Um, it is considered a Ptolemaic temple, which would have been uh, Greco-Roman. However, there's uh, a lot of, most of the temples were built and rebuilt over the same spaces because the place on the earth is what they chose that because of the, the the natural forces of nature that made it powerful they're harnessing the currents at those particular sites as part of the energy of the structure itself it's all part of a formula that they utilize to create a living breathing organism which we call temple temple which is tempo, tempo, time. So there, it's time living, you know, it's, it's living, breathing time that they're trying to express on the ceilings. And I guess there's just so many details at Dendera. This is why it's the place that holds all the mysteries. If you, if you remember, we went to Abydos and the scenery was gorgeous. Some of the most beautiful um, art, art, art craftsmanship in, in, in Egypt, but not nearly as intricate as what you see at Dendera. But it's telling different stories you know, about the, the, the Assyrian mysteries and some of the temple rituals. Of course, they're all speaking to the rituals, so that's another level. But uh, yeah, it's, it's even hard to understand and grasp because I think the artists were coming from a place of knowing that has somehow been lost today. And so even in interpretation, we have to jump out of our current understandings to open our minds to something greater when we're even looking at it. Yes, definitely. And I really feel that uh, we are awakening to it. And it's all a part of this uh, natural cycle, natural cycles um, mm -hmm. that we are engaged in, that we are a part of. And actually 
have a limited control of because we are a part of a greater plan. And the Egyptians had this amazing concept, outlook on uh, the perception of reality through, through eons, cycles, and like, like you said, any indigenous culture talks about the universe as a development of cycles, of endless, endless cycles, and not the way we see it today in the Western world as a linear line between past, present, and future. It's a, a line that we can close and make a circle. And or a figure eight. <laughs> Or the figure eight, yes, uh, which is a three-dimensional torus, and yeah. and you, the way you research uh, ancient Egypt, I really resonate with that because you integrate a lot of sacred geometry concepts and um, and symbols into it, and you really compare them to see how they are a part of the whole. What I wanted to ask you is about the concept of of cycles, what the Egyptians called, according to uh, Abdel Hakim Awyan, the five stages of the sun. How do you see it? How do you incorporate all your knowledge into it? Well, I actually based most of what my st I'm studying on the foundation that Hakim laid before us. So when I, I would look at things like he called the Sphinx Tefnut, I would I spent you don't know how many hours trying to prove or trying to find out and then confirm why she was Tefnut. He just said she was Tefnut, which is a female lioness. Okay, that I, I always felt that. I felt that in my gut, but I wanted to know why Tefnut. Um, and and the same thing with the stages of the sun. I looked at what he said and then I had I I, I make it, you know, I, I I knew it resonated with me and it reflected also the Vedic cycles. And so I looked deeper into what he was saying until I could figure it out for myself. I, I have a little bit of a, I'm very, I live my life very intuitively, but I also have a scientific nature. So I have to prove what I know to be true on an intuitive level. I always need to go further and prove it to myself in a scientific method. So I, I kind of try and maybe I'm trying to, to Bring the two hemispheres of my brain together but in any event so i look at these things like the five stages of the sun that you point out which hakim had laid out for us in other words the way the ancients saw everything you know and this is again worldwide if you go to another other cultures like in peru and in mexico and all over the world you, you see that there's so many cultures that we say worship the sun and so they make it sound like it's a pagan worship of a of a, a a star in the sky basically but that's not how they understood it they understood and, and even their gods we say that the Egyptians had a pantheon of gods well these pantheon of gods were called netters and it's where we get our word nature eternal nature you know natural uh, natal these words uh, emerge from an understanding that the gods and goddesses that we would tend to believe they worship were actually forces of nature. They had a reverence for how, you know, in a deep connection to their natural environment so that they understood and I believe even felt the currents of nature, the water as it moves through the Nile, uh, plants and how plants grow, the lotus. They understood every aspect of the lotus from the moment it, it emerges from its seed in the black earth through the water, lifts its little head out um, <laughs> stem, into the air to give birth. It opens its petal to give birth to the fiery sun inside. It becomes a symbol for the sun and the four elements. You know, and these are for four cycles. So they're even, if everything that they pro project to us and give to us, it comes from a very deep connection with the natural cycles that they found in their environment. And so when you, you begin to understand that, you see someone milking a cow, you start to understand that it's not just somebody milking a cow, that it has a deep symbolic reference to possibly the Milky Way and so many more, so many other things, you know, the feminine nurturing. So where to, I don't know where I got off on this, but, <laughs> but, but when, you know, we, we look at the stage of the sun, they're not, they're not, 
worshiping the sun, they're actually understanding not only the cycles of the sun as we see it rising, you know, it comes to noon, the highest point in the sky, right? And we have a, what we call shadowless moment because there's no shadows when the sun is directly over you. And then it starts to fall again until it sets. And so you get terms like the, you know, the, the terms for the horizon in terms of midday, in terms for what happens to the sun when it goes into the underworld. But it's deeper than that. They understood the cycles of the sun as far as the, the solar maximums and the solar minimums. And when the sun, you know, the flares come and when the, so they knew the heights of, you know, and they, this is where this multi-layer understanding of cycles and cycles within cycles happens. So when I talk about the five stages of the sun, is it begins with Kepper, Ra, Un, um, Aten, and Amen. You're not only talking about one day, the cycles of one day, but you're talking about the, the uh, cycles of the great year, or the procession of the equinoxes, and cycles of consciousness themselves. So Kepper, as I had said before, is the great awakening. You can relate Kepper to um, the moment that the sun rises and we see daylight for the first time. So you're emerging out of what would be called a night cycle. So you, you come out of this night cycle and you, you know, you, you spread your wings, right? That's your moment to fly into the sun. So the Kepper beetle, even the, the symbolism of the Kepper beetle is unbelievably intense and, 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 and it, it, you would think it's complex and yet it's, it's amazing in its simplicity, but the Kepper beetle is the symbol of, you know, w without its wings, that's, he emerges as the first uh, moment of form. And this Kepper beetle pushes a dung ball across the, the, the Milky Way to express the sun. So again, I'm, 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 I'm getting, possibly making everyone a little confused here. But anyway, so back to Kepper, then we go to Ra. So we'll go to Ra, which is mid, you know, the mid-morning, right? So Ra could be likened to a ram, who, you know, like a stubborn young child or a ram, somebody that's beginning to feel his oats, he's feeling his vitality come back to him. Then you have Un, and Un, Un is quite interesting. Un is where we get our word noon. Noon, or Un, as I said, is shadowless consciousness. But I don't know if most people realize that at noon or every day when the sun is in the mid heaven or at midnight, of course, on the other side of the earth, there is a pause. We have a perception that the sun has stopped moving. So it's a moment of silence and then it starts to move again. And so then we move, we fall, it, it begins to fall, but it falls out. The moment of silence can be likened to, um, it's, it's, likened to going back to the womb before you're even born. It's a moment when you have complete gnosis, stillness. When we're in the stillness, it's, it's that moment when you know you can feel everything before we're active again. So the moon, it's this moon represents gnosis. And then you come out of gnosis into Aten, and Aten is the highest state of consciousness when we're in action, we're living, we're breathing again. So Aten is the highest state of consciousness. And then we fall into Amen or Amun, which is the hidden. And that's when we fall back and the sun goes beneath the horizon. The sun sets. This is when, when Set actually chops Osiris into those pieces because we fall into separation consciousness at sunset. So Harus and, and Set, you often see them both having one figure, one human figure with two heads facing either direction. Horus is sunrise and, and, and set is sunset. So again, set is where we get our word Satan, right? Which we would think is the devil, but he really represents a concept of sunset into a night cycle. And then again, it gets complex because we're, are we looking at a day? Are we looking at a year? Are we looking at the great year? And all, we are looking at all of them. Yes, it's like endless dimensions within dimensions, all nested within each other, like a huge cosmic clock. Yes. <laughs> and again, it's seemingly sim simple once you understand the pattern. And, and this is what I think they mostly tried to tell us. And I actually heard Hakim say that, you know, people want or 
constantly asking how old are the pyramids? How many years was the earth here? How many, you know, how old are all the structures? Like, you know, in these kind of questions. And it's, it's never been about years because our perception of year changes with our perception of reality. It can speed, time can speed up, it can slow down, it can stop. And we're not, you know, what, what's happening, you know, it, it, the movement has a pulse. So if that's true, how can we go back and say, you know, oh, it's 10,000 years old when that perception of time constantly changes during, during that cycle of 10,000 years? And, and, but if you understand patterns and you look at it as just patterns of, of, of movement with vibration, it's almost like the pulse of the movement of the vibration, then you don't have to look at it in terms of years. You're actually looking at it in terms of, of consciousness rising and falling, of different perceptions of reality, of patterns that will continually repeat. And if you master the pattern, you've mastered the understanding of who and what we are and what's going to happen next. If there is a next, because time is an illusion. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's, it's not like we sit here and I talk about these things and I can talk about when, you know, things are going to change. We hit Polaris and everything's going to flip. And, but I'm talking about our current understanding. But if that changes, you know, and it can change. And I guess what I'm trying to say is we can, we can raise our levels of awareness in one yogic breath, which is an intake and outtake of breath. If I understand the pattern, I don't have to wait for what's happening with mass consciousness and their perception of time and space. I can change my inner world by changing my my own breath, my own vibration, my own understanding by awakening my own senses within. Yes, I believe so. I, I believe the same. Um, and this again connects me with the uh, principles of sacred geometry that everything exists beyond time and space. And as you said, you, we can look at it as a cycle of a day, of a year, of a galactic year, of maybe even greater cycles, but essentially it all exists together. And as I talked uh, with uh, Stephen Miller, we talked about this concept uh, also, and um, the fields of research uh, that are related to it to this concept in a very profound uh, way these days, and he mentioned it also in his book, is that quantum physics is actually become, becoming metaphysics. And this again, uh, you know, connects us with the concept of quantum entanglement and that everything is a part of this huge fractal and everything exists from the micro, to the macro, to, from the ma macrocosm to the ma to the microcosm, everything is endless dimensions nested within each other, as also Nassim Haramein says. So, just to be clear for the people who are listening to us, we are talking about five stages of the sun, which are Chefer, Ra, Un, Aten, and Amen. Did we talk about Ra? A little bit. Ra is like that stage after we've we've got we've stretched our wings out that we feel our vitality. We're like stubborn children that, that want to go out and use all our new strengths, our newfound, you know, senses more or less. And then we come into fullness in Un, um, that moment of silence. So on a three-dimensional level, we're also talking about uh, roughly sixty-five thousand year cycle, right? Well, again, I kind of stay away from talking about years. And I, I do know Hakeem spoke about, you know, these smaller cycles of five, about 5,000 years. Um, but what I'm discovering is something a little different. And um, I'm finding that there are these cycles within the great year that um, are actually quite mind blowing. That we, we could be, and, and I, I'm in agreement and again, this is something I'm researching currently. I, I can't, I don't have any definitive evidence other than I have a lot of suggested evidence, a lot of suggested evidence that there is a reversal. We, we are going to experience the winter solstice of the great year right now. 
we are we, we are pointed at Polaris, which is basically the understanding of procession is quite interesting. It, it, we must remember that we're dual um, in 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 this reality, in physical reality, we're, we have polar polarity, and so when we are precessing through one age, and and we're we're actually defining ourselves by looking at the northern hemisphere spin of the Earth, and this is how we define everything. So we say we're entering the age of Aquarius, but if you're looking, if you're living in the South Pole right now. And Aquarius is rising in the northern hemisphere, the south pole, you're watching Leo rise on the horizon, correct? So when you're precessing through any one age, you're also precessing through the other, depending on which way you're looking. So the idea, like for, you know, for example, if we're in Pisces, you know, which was the age of Christianity, Pisces, the two fish, we're also on the other side of the earth in Virgo, right? We're also precessing through Virgo, which is the virgin that gives birth to. Christ or Christ, you can see where I'm going with this. Yes. So we do precess through six basic ages before, just like the winter solstice when the sun reverses, there's stillness in the sun, then it, it's called a reversal. It, it, even here in Egypt, there's a reversal. This is really important. And then things start to move in another direction. So with the winter solstice of the year, the annual year, what we experience at the solstice is three days of stillness uh, and the, day, uh, the days in fall go, go longer and longer, and I mean shorter and shorter and shorter, excuse me, but after the solstice, we, they begin to get longer and longer and longer. It's, it's considered a reversal moment. And the same thing will happen in the great year. It's the fractal patterning we were just talking about. And so this will happen again, but what is that reversal? Does this mean a reversal of our, our, the Earth's magnetic field, which we seem to be there's, there's a lot of interesting anomalous stuff happening right now on the planet, and our our magnetic poles are shifting rapidly. Our our magnetic fields are thinning, and and again, remember the magnetic fields. We spoke about this before. Around the Earth are the wings of Isis and Nepet, right? So they're the veil that covers us when we're born into form, but they're thinning now. What does that mean for us? The veil is thinning. So that veil of forgetfulness is thinning and we're about to awaken again. So we are right now, and as Stephen Mailer teaches all the time, we're in the stage of Amen. We're in the hidden. You know, we, we, we are in the night cycle. Is this that moment of awakening when we move into Kepper? And Hakim said, yes, absolutely we are. And what that means is how do we go from day to night? There's a reversal. So, and what does that actually mean? So again, is that a reversal of magnetics? Will there be a moment of stillness? I said there must be. So what happens? Does that mean the earth will stop spinning? Now I know this is gonna sound, and, and I, I have a geologist that I work with, her name is Susan Moore, and she, she's always funny because she, she sees what I'm showing, she sees the pattern, she knows what I'm saying, she's helping me prove many of the, the, the theories that I speak about, but when I get to the point where the earth stops moving, she immediately says, well, Patricia, everything would burn up, you know, the, that would be the end, the, no one would survive. And I look at her and say, well, if you believe that everything is real, you're absolutely right. But all of this is the illusion. Are we going to wake up from the illusion of form? And then will the earth start spinning again and we're born again, just as the ancients speak about in the mythologies, born again into another perception of reality where we begin to realize and again that's the un united consciousness unified consciousness so we're born into this awakened state and we rise into our own again which would be moving through Ra and then moving into age of scorpio and if, and if this happened by the way my whole my whole feeling is the earth stops the magnetics flip we actually start to spin in the opposite direction because we've just experienced patriarchal consciousness and all of the ancients say we, we actually must experience both. Yes, in smaller cycles, but also in this great year cycle. If we've, if we've just experienced, you know, six ages of one particular expression, wouldn't we experience another? Um, and so if we move into the belief that we are totally unified, do we move into a formless perception of reality where we can really create? 
we can shape shift, we can, we can build pyramids, we can move mountains, we can shape the earth, we can create our game board before we're born again and we fall into form. Is this all possible? I think it's absolutely possible and probable even. Wow. If we look into how we perceive reality, that's the most exciting part of this. Um, there's a lot of people doing work with this right now. Our perception of reality is quite interesting because we see the world upside down and backwards. So we're not even seeing what's real. There are those that say, you know, we're experiencing the shadow of what's real in the space in between. So what if we become that what's in the space in between? That's all I'm suggesting. Mm. You know, right now when we see blue, we're actually seeing yellow. The, the light reflected off of yellow appears blue to our physicality. So what if we end up in a world where yellow is yellow? Just a thought. I'm thinking about a couple of things. First of all, it reminds me what was uh, perceived in 2012, same concept of three days of stillness, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that we were also anticipating this kind of event. Probably a lot of things happened, but maybe not the way we thought they would happen. And a lot of the changes are hidden, so we don't even know that they're happening. And now, lately, I'm uh, <clears throat> a lot into um, quantum hypnosis healing and mm. the use of uh, Dolores Cannon. And, yes. and a lot of the people uh, that are being uh, under hypnosis when we're told about what they say under hypnosis, they, they mention a kind of an event that is going to happen, a, a solar event, a solar, a major solar flash, solar sneeze. So I, I, was, I was wondering if you heard about it or, and if you subscribe to this idea. I absolutely do. Um, I've been reading a lot lately about my, a possible micronova event, a cyclical micronova. So it wouldn't be a full supernova, but a solar event that would really ooh, shock the earth, which could shock, every, put everything into motion that I was just talking about. Um, the story of Sekhmet speaks to this in a beautiful way. Um, it's and, and, and I'll, I'll give you the brief short version, but Sekhmet is that beautiful lioness we saw her at Karnak, Karnak the, the statue of her, who it's alive. It's, it's just an incredible place to be. But anyway, Sekhmet herself is the fiery lion. Uh, she, what she represents is when Ra looks down and sees that we're in this state of chaos due to separation consciousness, he looks down on earth and he sees that everybody is, is you know, we're at war and, and the dissension and everything that we're experiencing. He gets angry and he, he wants to put it, he wants to make a stop to it. And so he takes his eye of Ra and the eye of Ra, as he's pulling it, it's actually the eye of, eye of Hathor. So it, it, it's the eye of Ra that is actually the feminine of Hathor, which is the nurturing rays of the sun that are usually nurturing us in our agriculture. And he takes that, and as he takes it in anger, it becomes the fiery Sekhmet. And the, she represents the fiery rage or, or the fierce rays of the sun. So he takes it and he throws it down to earth. And she, she rages and she scourges the earth, bloodthirsty with rage. And she's you can almost, you can consider this or liken it to the volcanoes, the earthquakes, everything that happens when we have our major solar flares, we see it happening and some other events that we can discuss too. But anyway, so she's raging and raging and he gets upset and he thinks that, it, you know, everything will be destroyed. And so he turns the Nile into wine. Now there's all different stories, pomegranate wine, whatever it is, but he turns it. And, and so she sees the red, you know, the red flowing blood that she considers it is, and she drinks it and she passes out from the wine. But she passes out for three days. See, we have our moment of silence, the stillness. The rage stops, the calm after the storm. And when she opens her eyes, the first thing she sees is Ptah. And Ptah 
is that path. He is the projection. Pata is the netter that you see standing. He, some people say he's mummified, but you'll see images of him and he's wrapped in his own wings. He's earthbound. He has the blue cap on his head and the blue cap is the primordial waters of moon. It is the primordial waters from which all, everything is born. So he is projected, literally, he represents the process of the projection from out of the blue into becoming form. He is that process. So they merge, they come together, they get married, you know, if you will, as forces of nature, and together they give birth to Nefer tomb. And Nefer tomb is the netter that has the lotus on his head, right? So it's like the, the rebirth of the sun, but Nefer means harmony, mm -hmm. right? And tomb is the atom. So when we give birth to form, the creation story is it said Atum is the one that gives birth to the netters, right? The Aeneid, the, the, the Tefnut and Shu. And well, Atum is the Atum that we are familiar with that gives birth to form, right? But Nefertum is the harmony of the Atum. So it's another existence, it's another reality where we exist in harmony. So what a beautiful story that tells what we've just talked about. Yes, amazing. And also, you also uh, investigate the connections uh, between cultures, be uh, between mythology. And uh, there are parallel stories in the Hindu tradition, Kali uh, in Hinduism, and Lilith in Judaism. And they're basically all the same uh, raging feminine archetype, right? Yes, absolutely. It's the power of the feminine is, what's interesting is we have the current, L, like electricity, we have the current, and, and it's masculine, it exists, it's, it's a sine wave, right? But the feminine is the breath, it's the pulse, it's the vibration, sound, that's why Hattor has the, the ears, the cow ears, and she has the, 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 what represents sound on her head, the crown. Sound is what keeps everything alive, right? It's the pulse. And if it's rhythmic, then it's in harmony, right? And if it's not rhythmic, if it's, it's not resonant, then we're in a state of chaos. So sound is everything. So the feminine that is in, in harmony, right? That's beautiful. That's a beautiful vibration. But the feminine also has the ability to become enraged. The rage is part of the feminine dynamic. So it's either the softening, the nurturing rays, or the fierce rays. That's just speaking to the force of nature that is the, the current itself. A current agriculturally, and I, this is another part of my research, is seed uh, technologies. The ancients, oh, they knew how to plant a seed and feed millions of people. We've lost that ability. We, we're destroying our planet today with our agricultural technologies. But um, the, the nurturing like of the sun, it nurtures the seed right? It nurtures our, you know, our growth. We don't exist without the rays of the sun. But as we just said, when it's fierce, when it's now, it can burn something, right? It's, so it has that, that, that's the fiery feminine nature. Yes, yes, exactly. And uh, right in the beginning of 2019, in August, when we were in the sign of Leo, there was a specific constellation that Black Moon Lilith was in Leo. So the meaning of this archetype was that the raging archetype of femininity, the oppressed feminine, um, the Me Too movement, uh, you know, the, this whole uprising of, of the inner feminine that wants to, to be heard, to have a, a safe space in the world. And I think we're going to see it throughout the next decade. What do you think? I agree with you wholeheartedly. In fact, when I talk about the rage of Sekhmet, I often describe it as she's ripping her heart, you know, her chest open to reveal her heart because what patriarchal has meant to us is the suppression of the heart, which is the feminine. So the patriarchal sort of represents the mind and the heart is the feminine. And in, in, the, in the past, since the age of Taurus, we have so suppressed worldwide the feminine. It began with the witch hunts. It began, you know, the, all of the witch hunts in, in Scotland 
uh, were based on the woman, you know, and this is, this is in everywhere. It was in, in Egypt, it was in all cultures. The woman held all the abilities for healing and nurturing. They understood plant medicines. They, they held the wisdom. Um, in fact, in ancient, uh, in, the, in these areas around Egypt, Kemet, uh, the women elders of the tribe were called the Marys, if you will. So in that Mary comes down through time to become the Mary uh, that we know in Christianity, Mary Mag. Mary Magdalene is, is, a, is a current Magdalene, um, not necessarily not a living, breathing person, but the name, it, 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 the expression of the story comes through a formula of how everything fits together and just perfectly. But what you're speaking of, you know, is this moment. This is our Sekhmet moment. This is our Lilith moment, our Kali moment. This is the moment that not just men, not just women, but men as well. We have all suppressed the heart. We, you know, I can remember in grade school where women were taught to be, you know, we were, we were supposed to walk with books on our head and be, you know, sweet and polite and docile, you know, and the men are, you know, and, and in Egypt, I see this happening in spades. It's changing now on, on the planet. And I do think this is our segment moment to say enough is enough. We need, it's the heart, the suppression of the heart. The men have suppressed the heart every bit as much as the women. And uh, it's a healing for everyone, the entire planet. Yes, exactly. Uh, and I think this, this is why this knowledge is so crucial for us in this day and age, because really, you know, if we don't know where we're coming from, and the nature of our existence then of course we we don't know where we're going and this can also give us uh, a lot of patience and understanding and um, perseverance to to stay on our path because you know we're running for long distances here and uh, and also if we don't have a really um, a day-to-day spiritual practice and and knowledge and the connection to the divine it's very hard to withstand everything that's going on on this planet at this time it's so chaotic uh so this gives a lot of um a lot of sense and a lot of logic as to why are things evolving the way that they are and um and also what Stephen Miller mention, mentions in his book, uh, From Light to Darkness, about the development that we were going through from matriarchy to patriarchy, and to understand how all of this happened within uh, the context of the great flood, the cataclysm that we experienced in the, the ice age 11,000 uh, years ago, and to understand how this affected the psyche of the people from being in a consciousness of abundant world, a great mother that you know gives us everything that we need to um, to the consciousness of, of scarcity and survival, then we can also bring in more compassion into the understanding of patriarchy and not just be in hatred and uh and resistance to this very very loaded subject yes exactly i agree i agree so would you like to 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 talk a little bit about uh your books that are coming out and your researches <laughs> well i i am in the process of writing what i wanted to do is you know i lead a lot of i host a lot of tours here in egypt and uh I find myself wanting to go deep, deep, deep into the information when it's not fair because people don't even understand who the netters are for me to start talking about what they represent, you know, on, uh, on uh, all the different levels. So I thought I would write something very foundational and I'm getting into it now and it's going to be a little bit more than that. So I think it's going to turn into a series where I, you know, I just can't just say that Patab represents this or Hattor is love and dance and rhythm. I need to go deeper. Um, it's just my nature. So I'm going to start out with a, a pretty good foundational book that gives you an understanding of what hematology is. Um, from a uh, from a newer standpoint, I'll go a little deeper, 
And then um, I'm going to continue the series. I do want to write a book about Hattor. I've got that one started as well, um, where I really talk about how that her whole expression um, speaks to all of the cycles. And uh, I really want to go deep into what Dendera and Hattor represent, as I said. I've been also working on a, on a new lecture for that as well. And then, of course, um, I do want to... I want to talk about the seed and the seed, you know, the, the mythologies worldwide are all based on our agricultural processes. Um, it could be based on, you know, wheat in one place, corn in another, but they, they understand the cycles in terms of being, you know, planted as a seed in the deep dark earth, the night cycle, and then, you know, scrambling to find the light and then you know the whole you, you've got you know you've got your moment in the ground and then you've got your moment when you you become out of the ground and you, you, you grow and you reach the sun and then what happens next the digestion so all emulating the cycles um but their their understandings of how to grow seeds and their agricultural processes were so advanced and if we could utilize those techniques in the end we could we, there would be no starving on earth. Um, of course, you know, we have so many different issues right now with world population and, um, you know, inequality uh, when it comes to, you know, third world countries and Western worlds. And there's just, I can't begin to, to mention, but if we could at least feed the masses something that's, you know, not going to, to, to harm the body. And then there's, you know, it, it just goes on and on. I, <laughs> it's just so many things. So I'm working on all these projects. I do have a team that I work with. I've always got things going on everywhere. It's sometimes <laughs> hard to, to get any one project done, but um, uh, it's just because I'm so passionate about everything I'm doing and, and the information just keeps flowing in and I don't want to miss anything as I'm getting this documented. But I do realize I need to get it out because people are asking. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah, I'm waiting patiently, and you know I can't wait for it to, to be out and to read it. Um, but I know it's it's a process, and as you said, it's it's really uh, a mission to to make this information accessible and to clean it out of the misconceptions of God pantheon, gods and goddesses pantheon, and um, the whole mainstream approach to what are gods as, you know, I don't know, advanced people that we worship, rather more deeply to relate them as a part of sacred geometry, universal principles that govern the world well you you bring something very important up because when i think of gods and people say you know the gods once walked the earth and i say we were the gods that once walked the earth you know in some of the assyrian rituals which is another thing i'm studying they talk about you know and I, i'm not going to go into great detail here but the priests the high priests and the kings would go through these rituals where they would utilize plant medicines or in, in other forms to go through a, a kind of death and then a connection with the divine, which is, again, if you've ever talked to anyone who's had a near-death experience, they have that moment of feeling totally at one with the universe, you know, in that feeling of understanding all of the dimensions of everything culminating in the one and then breathing out again. Well, this is what these rituals were all about, is and in, in, in essence, the whole theme is when they come back, when the king comes back from his Hepset festival, his jubilee, when the priest would come back and be brought back to life, they brought the power of God, the divine, back to earth again. And that's why the king is placed on a throne, because he, he, the throne means when he sits on that throne, he's, brought the, he's exalted, he's brought the power of God back to earth. But that's something we all had at one time. It's just when we fall into, so this was all occurring as we were falling and they were able to do it so much easier. We still can do it today, but we've lost, we've forgotten how. And I think that's what, what I'm trying to bring back is the knowledge and the ability that we all can bring back that power. We can remember their connectedness because if we were to focus less, 
and, and not at all on what, ma what makes us different from each other. And we're to focus on how we're all alike, that unified consciousness. We wouldn't be at war with each other. It, it couldn't be. If we could feel our connection to all that is, that divinity, we wouldn't harm anything because it's all us. It's all me. We are the gods that walk the earth. We just forgot. Yes, exactly. And I think that's why also plant medicine is becoming more and more uh, central in this day and age. And actually in three weeks from now, uh, on February, uh, I'm doing a collaboration with uh, an amazing uh, dream work researcher and herbalist and mm -hmm. we're uh, collaborating to talk about ancient Egypt me from the cosmology uh, part of what I have researched and she from from the approach of plant medicine and uh, dream work medicine dream work plants mm -hmm. so That's wonderful. it's gonna be fascinating I'm excited to hear more. <laughs> yeah, and I, I will also love to, to learn from you more, what you know about uh, dream work, psychedelics, plant medicine in ancient Egypt, but we can do it on another time. Oh, I look forward to it. We dedicate uh, a conversation to the Lotus or anything else you would like. There's so many things we can talk about, you know. Oh, and yes. <laughs> Most definitely. I would look forward to it. Wonderful. So I think we'll, uh, we'll finish for today. But it's been such a, a pleasure talking to you. And uh, I hope we're going to do it again soon. I hope so too, Yasmin. And you have a great day. And thank you. I'm honored to uh, be uh, talking to you again here. Yeah, yeah, me too. So it's been, yeah, it's been an honor to talk to you. And uh, good luck with all your researches. And we'll talk soon. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.